Good afternoon. My name is Rod Cox. I'm with the Simon Center, which is part of the Commander General Staff College Foundation. And on behalf of the Commander General Staff College, our partners and our sponsors, First Command Financial Planning Services, we welcome you to this, the 10th and final iteration of our interagency brown bag lecture series for academic year 2018. Um, I will let you know that this, this presentation is being recorded for use by the distance learning students um, and will be hung at the Simon Center website for our interagency practitioners to use. So what that means to you is if you engage in dialogue with questions with our presenter, uh, please use one of the microphones that are on the tables in front of you. You don't need to do anything with them. I believe our technician will turn them on. So you just need to speak and he'll pick you up. So now, leadership in the interagency, as most of you know, is quite different than in a hierarchical structure, say, of one of the uniform services. Um, there's usually no one singular person in charge, necessarily, and even if they've been appointed in charge, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the authority to tell someone what to do. Um, leadership in the interagency requires a different style of leadership. Actually, a different approach, not necessarily style, because, as I mentioned, the because I said so mentality will not work at all. You have to be more nuanced. So today's presentation is designed to provide you something that you might consider as a leadership style, technique, methodology to use in the interagency that doesn't rely necessarily on the because I told you so or because I was given the authority to be in charge of this operation. And we could have nobody better to do that than obviously our own chair of the Department of Leadership here in the college. Ted Thomas, PhD holder, Lieutenant Colonel, retired from the United States Army, um, is the department chair for the leader, Department of Command and Leadership in the Command and General Staff College here at Fort Leavenworth. Dr. Thomas graduated from the United States Military Academy, and he served over 20 years in various command and staff assignments before retiring as having served as a battalion commander of the 554th Engineer Battalion. He received his Master's of Science degree in Civil Engineering from the University of Illinois and a PhD in Engineering Management from Missouri University of Science and Technology. He joined the CGSC faculty in 2005 and has served as the Director of the Department since 2007. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ted Thomas. Uh, thank you for showing up today. I, I've <laughs> I see a lot of my department here, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's great. Some of this you may have heard before, but, uh, but I think there's, I'll, I'll get some things that, uh, that a lot of you haven't heard before, too. So I'm going to talk about hands, head, and heart leadership. And it's a, it's a model that I came up with after looking at leadership and reading for leadership for 15 plus years. And, uh, and I think it's applicable to military, it's applicable to civilian, it's applicable to whatever. I, I will have a lot of military examples just because that's in, in my background uh, and, and it's what I've experienced. But because today is a special day, what day is today? June 6th. It's June 6th, D-Day. So because it's D-Day, I, I feel obligated to, to start off with a, a little clip from a movie called Ike, Countdown to D-Day. And uh, it's, it's a scene where, where Ike is trying to get to gall on board with the plan for the invasion. And, uh, and you will see a perfect failure of hands, head, and heart leadership in this little clip. So without, without further ado, Brett, if you could uh, show that clip. OK. I think that's a rousing example of a failure of both the, to agree on what they want to do, to understand each other's logic, and to have a, an idea of what each one of them valued and what their beliefs were on where they wanted to go. So it was a failure of the hands, head, and heart on all levels. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we try to bring those into alignment. I'm going to start off with a, a story. And it's a, it's a story about a sergeant major and, and a trash detail, right? So if I have, uh, if I'm Sergeant Major Thomas, and I've got a general coming to, to my area, and there's a bunch of trash in my, in my area. I have different ways I can handle this. But one way that you've probably all seen is, is the sergeant major comes out there and says, hey, private ward, get over here right now. You better get out there and pick up that garbage or I'm going to, and just right in your face, you know, the spit kind of coming and, 
and the uh, private's there just gonna, gonna go do what he's, what he's asked to do. I, I, as Sergeant Major Thomas, can control his hands, right? I can punish him if he doesn't do what I wanna do. I can make sure that his life is miserable if he doesn't obey orders. I can coerce him into doing what I want. Now, that's kind of an extreme example. It is, as a more gen gentler example is I'm a grandfather, right? So I've got like 23 grandkids. I have eight children. And, and in teaching my children how to pick up, you know, when they're like two or three years old, I would say, hey, pick up your blocks. And, and they'd look at me like, what are you talking about? So I'd take their little hands and I'd pick it up a block and I'd put it away for them and I'd gently teach them how to do it. But it's the same type of principle. It's just I'm being very nice about coercing them and making and forcing them and using their hands to accomplish what I want them to accomplish. Okay, so th the next example. Now, once again, I'm sorry, Major Thomas. I, I've got Private Chapman here. And, uh, and I bring Private Chapman over and say, hey, Private, you see all that garbage out there? You know, the general's coming here in a couple hours. What do you think he's going to think? You know, it looks kind of trashy. Maybe yeah. we should pick it up. Maybe we should pick it up. You're right. Can you get some of your buddies like uh, Private Beer Cordy here and, and go pick up that garbage for me? Sure. Ah, uh, yeah. So I think Ward can help out. And, and they, yeah, Private Ward, he, he's still recovering from the last time I, I yelled at him. So, but at any rate, so uh, he's, yeah, he's still doing push-ups. So what I've done is, is I've tried to use logic and reasoning. I've appealed to their, their, their head and said, hey, I want you to comply with what I'm asking you to do. Okay? So now Private Miller shows up. And he's reporting in to Command Sergeant Major Thomas. This is his first day in the unit. Private Miller, go ahead and report. <laughs> Private Miller reporting in. Good, to good. <laughs> good. Private <laughs> Miller. <Major>. You know. <laughs> Private Miller, you know, you are now in the best unit in this division. We're the best of the best above the rest. And one of the things that we do in our unit is we make sure that we pick up garbage. So if you see some garbage, I expect you to pick it up. In fact, if I see garbage, I'm going to pick it up. If you don't want to be in the best unit in the division, I, I've got, you know, Command Sergeant Major Woolley's unit down the, just down the road. He will take you today in a heartbeat. If <laughs> no, you, I won't. If, I know him. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to be in the best unit around. So what am I asking you to do? I'm asking you to commit to a value, to a standard. And so when the general comes for his inspection, do I have to go around and get people to pick up the garbage? No, because it's already picked up. And it's not there because that's the culture that we've established. So when I look at this, there are different ways that you can exercise leadership. And sometimes you need to use the hands force coercion way. Sometimes you need to appeal to logic, and sometimes you need to appeal to the heart. And you as a leader have to understand which is, which is most appropriate and when. All right, so now I've got another story. Because the Army's old uh, um, leadership doctrine used to be be no do, right? So be no do it really ties in with the hands head and heart the doing piece is really about the hands and knowing is about the head and the becoming is about the heart because we're all human becomings right we're all becoming something every day based on what we do what we think what we read what, what we put into us how we act we're all becoming something and so the foundation of what we're becoming is on the doing and knowing Quick story, maybe not a quick story, but a story on this was uh, back when I was a, a first lieutenant. I was an engineer, in, uh, and I applied to become the support platoon leader of the 2nd 75th Ranger Battalion. Uh, and they accepted me, which was kind of weird because that was uh, an infantry slot, and they, they slotted this, this engineer into an infantry slot. I, I moved in in the summertime when they were on block leave, and my first two weeks after block leave, was jump master school. Now, if, if you kind of understand a, a little bit of the dynamics going on here, I had not jumped out of an airplane since ranger school two and a half years before, and hadn't been to jump school for since about five or six years before that. So here it is, my first assignment in the ranger battalion, and I'm going through jump master school. And for those of you that have been through jump master school, 50% is kind of like uh, a high graduation rate, if you know what I mean. And so here I am, this infantry dude, feeling like I'm an imposter, feel, you know, engineer dude, feeling like I'm an imposter, you know, as, a, as an infantry officer, and, and I'm put into the school. And now, to, to give you context, when I went to the 82nd uh, Airborne Division after this, you had to be on jump status for a year and had to have, 
at least 10 jumps under your belt before they'd send you to jump master school. They had a range of battalion. They just did things different. So they threw me in. So at any rate, the, the other aspect to this is, is I get motion sick. Uh, you know, it's just really bad. I, I mean, if I sit in the back of a car and we're going down a windy road, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm reaching for the, the bag to throw up in or the window or whatever. So an airplane's get me really motion sick too. Uh, and the other thing, aspect is, is I'm afraid of heights. You know, and, and I don't know if you've, uh, this is kind of difficult, you know, of going to jump master school and hanging out on airplanes. But, you know, if, if I get on like the fourth floor and I, and I kind of lean over the rail, my, the back of my legs just kind of want to get all, all shaky and weird. And, and uh, I just don't like heights. In fact, I was just up on the roof helping my daughter fix uh, some roof leaks, patching with some tar. And she said, Dad, you look a little scared up here. I said, well, that's because I, I kind of don't like heights, you know. <laughs> She said, you're, you're awful tentative. I was making sure I maintained, you know, three points of contact and everything. But, but at any rate, I, I don't like heights. It's just one of those things. So the first week in Jump Master School is, is the ground week, and you're doing all the JMPI stuff. So you're not, and you get to where you do that hundreds of times, and, and you have, it's muscle memory. You just know what's going on. And that's that hands piece. I had that hands piece down to where I, I knew exactly what to do. You know, squat, hold, turn, bam, go. And, uh, and I could get, get through that. So that first week, we had like four jumpers that they had different uh, malfunctions set up in. And I, I got through. I, I passed that, that first week. And that first week, a lot of people didn't pass. So I was pretty happy. It's the second week that was giving me problems because that was the actions in the aircraft where you have to actually get in an airplane and, and do all the actions in the aircraft. And, and one of them is like hanging out the door looking for other planes. And, and when you're like, you know, 1,200 feet up in the air, uh, that was difficult. But... But at any rate, so my very first jump since, since ranger school, I was the lucky enough guy to be selected as a jump master, right? So here I am, my very first jump, and, and I'm thinking, okay, I got to do this right. So I'm up there, I'm really nervous and scared, so, so I start to give my commands. Get, get ready. Outboard personnel, stand up. Inboard personnel, stand up. Hook up. And so I went through the whole <laughs> jump commands, and I did it exactly correct. You know, I did my door check. I hung out the door, and I actually kept my eyes open. And it's kind of funny because the guys that, that are grading you, they actually get out there and look in your face to make sure your eyes are open. But so, and I don't think they hang out the door anymore. I, I, it's, this is like, I'm dating myself. This is like 30-some-odd years ago. So at any rate. I got on the ground, and, uh, and the guy grade me came up to me, and I said, how did I do? He said, well, you did everything right, but you flunked. I said, well, what? How can you flunk me if I did everything right? And he said, well, you were scared. I said, yeah, I agree. I was scared. And he said, a scared jump master is going to make sure every jumper on that airplane is scared, and a scared jumper is not a safe jumper. You flunked. And so then I thought, how do I not get motion sick and scared of heights? So I went home to my wife and said, hey, I, I'm a failure. I flunked. I said, what am I going to do to try and overcome you know, this so that, so, that I, so that I can become what I want to become, which is a competent, confident jump master? And she said, oh, you know, she gave me one of those answers like, oh, why don't you pray about it? I said, oh. So, all right. So I went and prayed, and I thought and pondered, and I thought, what am I going to do? And I, and, and I finally decided that. I'm going to have to win my own little Oscar. You know, it's going to be the, t the TED Oscar. Instead of an Emmy, it'll be a Teddy or something. I don't know. You know, it'll be, uh, I, I'm going to create my own. I'm going to act through this. And I, I watched a, a TED Talk by Amy Cuddy, I think. She said, act it until you become it. It's not, or fake it until you become it. And it's not fake it until you make it. It's fake it until you become it. And I thought, I'm going to act my way through this. And so I, I thought about it. I said, OK. If I'm a competent, confident jump master, what would I act like? And so I thought, well, you know, you got to kind of throw your shoulders back, right? Kind of, you know, kind of get broad and, and like, uh, and just kind of go around and grunt at people. So, you know, I'm, I'm jump master and I got, isn't it great? Don't you like a dump? You know, and just kind of slapping people on the back and just kind of uh, throwing my chest out and say, hey, this is good stuff. And I'm thinking, all the while, I'm thinking, oh, I hope they believe me. But uh, so, then, so then I get, get on the aircraft, and I'm thinking, okay, I've got to give these jump commands. 
So how do I give jump commands where I look like I'm competent and confident? And I thought, you know, if I get those little, little things like this kind of poking out of my neck and, and maybe just kind of yell, a little spit coming out of the mouth kind of things, you know, eyes bulging. So I thought maybe if I do that, kind of look angry, that, that, hey, maybe I'll pass, you know? So I was up there like, all right, get a little psyched up. Get free! Don't move or I'll stand up! Don't move or I'll stand up! Hook up! And so I'm, <laughs> sorry, hopefully I didn't spit on anybody. <laughs> So I got on the ground, and guess what? I passed, you know, so it was good. But what I found when I did that, you know, I knew what to do. I had the knowing and the doing piece down, but I didn't have the becoming piece down. I had the desire, but I had to build trust in myself, and I had to build trust in the people that were, that were evaluating me and the, and the jumpers that were going to jump out uh, of the aircraft. And the only way to do that was to try to become who I wanted to become to become confident and competent. And when I made that choice, I made the choice to instead of focus inward on me, to focus outward on those that I was leading. I made the choice to not worry about my fears, but to worry about their fears. And when I did that, I stopped worrying about my fears. And, and I ended up becoming what I wanted to become. So I really didn't have a problem with that the rest of my time, although I still threw up on, <laughs> on occasion when they were doing like nap of the earth kind of stuff. Okay, so when I look at this, to, to put this in perspective, if I'm focusing on hands type leadership, it's normally in a training environment. If I'm focusing on head, it's more in the education environment. If I'm focusing on heart, it's more an inspiration. So I, I've got just a quick, another, another story to kind of talk about, about this. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hughes, recently retired Major General Chris Hughes. He, uh, he was a battalion commander in the 101st in the invasion of Iraq. And he was going, he had a mission to take, uh, to take uh, Najaf. So they were going on the way to Najaf, they're out there at, out, outside Najaf, and they're fighting Saddam Hussein's forces. He's got artillery, he's got tanks, he's got helicopters. They're all pounding these positions. And in the middle of this thing, one of his interpreters comes up to him and tugs on his sleeve and says, hey, you've got to stop firing. Well, here's a battalion command, infantry battalion commander in the middle of a firefight, and he's like, go away. Can't you see I'm kind of busy? And, and the guy kind of went away. And then about 10 or 15 minutes later, he came back and said, tugged on his sleeve again, said, you've got to stop firing. And then Colonel Hughes kind of got out of the moment enough to say, all right, why do I need to stop firing? And his interpreter, who is Shia Muslim, said, do you see that gold dome over there on that mosque? That gold dome mosque is the most sacred mosque in the Shia religion. And in 15 minutes is going to be a call to prayer. And when that call to prayer comes, hundreds and hundreds of people are going to go to that mosque to pray. And if you keep firing, you're going to kill lots of innocent civilians. You've got to stop firing. And so Colonel Hughes thought, he's right. So he, he got his, his loudspeaker guys, he ceased fired, and he got on the loudspeaker and said, hey, we're going to stop firing so that you can go pray at the mosque. And what Saddam Hussein's forces did, when they stopped firing, it's like, well, nobody's shooting at me. There's a lot of people out there trying to kill me. This is a good time to leave. So they went and left. Well, al-Sistani, who's like the chief cleric in the Shia religion, lives next door to the Muhammad Ali Mosque, right? And Saddam Hussein used to have a, a group of folks that would protect him. So he had a security detail. Well, when Saddam Hussein's forces left, they left with him. So al-Sistani thought, hey, this Hughes guy must not be a too bad a guy if he, if he asked him to stop shooting while, while we go to pray. So he said, hey, why don't you come and, and send a security detail down and secure my area tomorrow? And so Hughes, the next day, is walking with a, a company of, of his 101st guys 
And, you know, they're all, they were just pulling the trigger yesterday, you know, as they got, you know, all their weapons and, and stuff, and, and they've been fighting, and, and they're kind of ready to, to fight again. And they're walking down the street towards the Muhammad Ali Mosque because Sistani is next door to this mosque, when all of a sudden some Saddam Hussein sympathizers came out and said, hey, they're going to desecrate the mosque. And so people started bailing out of their houses and linking arms and saying, no mosque, no mosque, trying to prevent the soldiers from moving towards the mosque. Well, you, you've got all these guys with lots of weapons and ammo and stuff, and you've got an angry mob, and Hughes looking at this thing thinking, you know, all I need is one person to throw a rock and somebody, you know, who's triggering his, his safety switch to shoot, and then everybody else is just going to mow these people down, and I'm going to have hundreds of dead bodies like that. Boom. So he said, okay, you know, for, for training, we train on a lot of things. But in this instance, there, there's no, like, ADRP or FM that you can go to that says, hey, what do you do when you're confronted by an angry mob when you're going to the, you know, it's not written in FM. So there's nothing there. So he had to say, okay, what am I going to do? And the first thing he did, he said, okay, point your weapons down. <laughs> Last thing I want is you <laughs> he's shooting somebody accidentally. So, he, so everybody, point your weapons down. They're well trained. They all point their weapons down. Still kind of angry mob yelling. So he said, take a knee. So, so you got, you know, 100 infantry dudes taking a knee with their weapon pointed down. And then he gave a command that's not in any, any drill and ceremonies book or whatever. He can't, commanded them to smile. So you got 100 infantry dudes on their knee with their weapon pointed down, smiling at this angry crowd. And so, what's that? Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. Cheesy, big cheesy smiles. So what happened was the mob then took a seat and sat down and stopped yelling. And then Colonel Hughes thought, this is not worth it. Sistani is the one that wants me to do this. I'm not going to kill his people to, to provide a security detail. And then he said, okay, I'm not doing this mission anymore. Let's leave. So he said, just get up, turn your backs, and leave. He didn't say, you know, go back warily in case they, he just said, turn around and leave. That, that shows you that you're not afraid of them, we're not worried about them, that we're just respecting what they want us to do. And so they turned around and left. <coughs> now, his soldiers were well trained, but it was his education, his studying of Iraq, the Muslim religions, and people that allowed him to figure things out, to say, hey, I'm in a position where th bad things are going to happen if I continue down this road. So he used his education to avoid a massacre that would have inspired a whole country against our country and look, looked at us as, instead of liberators, as, as invaders. So he used this, not directly, not thinking about it, but he certainly used this. So when I look at the difference between these things, I look at, at training. I look at training as being input, action, reflection. So if I'm training for an ambush, you know, I'm going down the road and I have an ambush, that's my input. I immediately take action. I go into my battle drills. It's like when I'm when jumping out of an airplane. I immediately go into a tight body position, right? And it's, it's muscle memory. It's TTP. It's battle drills, tactics, techniques, procedures. It's th stuff that you train for that you know that you can uh, – you can time it, you can uh, you do for a certain distance, or it's, it's measurable. So if I'm an artillery unit and I want to move from point A to point B and get steel down range, you know, I can, I can put a timer to that. I can put an accuracy to that. Am I going to hit the target? That's the training kind of piece. The education piece is more like you have an input and there is no TTP. There is no battle drill. Then you have to think about it. So you have to reflect. So you've got an input, then you take a reflection, and then you take an action. And that's exactly what... Colonel Hughes did. He had some type of input. He had to think about, what am I going to do? He had to reflect on it, and then he took action. All right, point your weapons down, take a knee, smile, get out of here, turn around and go and leave. When I look at the inspiration piece, the inspiration piece is, is really uh, connected to, to values and heart. And and when I, I use an example for this one, I use, uh, I'm going to use a big example. I'm going to use 
uh, the Affordable Care Act for inspiration. Now, I don't care what your opinion is on the Affordable Care Act, but if you're a strategic leader and, and you look at that issue of health care, there, there's kind of like it's coalesced into two different uh, factions. One says that health care is a right that everybody deserves. And if health care is a right that everybody deserves, then it's the government's responsibility to provide that. The other group says the government is the least effective, efficient way to do much anything, much less health care. Plus, the government has no right to force me to pay for your birth control. You ought to pay for your own birth control or control yourself, you know? So, so there's, there's this, this piece that says the government has no business getting involved in this, and the other one says it's a right, an individual's right, and the government has a responsibility to provide for it. So, so there's two different ways of looking at it. So what's going on in that realm is you've got people that are trying to convince you that their way is right. And so when I talked about input, action, reflection, with the, the training scenario, you've got input, you take an action, reflection is your AAR. Or in the education scenario, when you have input, reflection, action, you stop and think. In the inspiration piece, when you're trying to move people and, and affect them to heart, then you normally do the reflection first and say, hey, where do I want people to go? What do I want them to believe? What do I want them to, to, to feel? And then you take an action. So now it's reflection, action, and then you look for what the output is. So let me go back to during Bill Clinton's presidency. He tried to do health care reform. Hillary Clinton was involved in it. They reflected on it. They took action. They found the output. It didn't happen. During Obama's presidency, reflected on it, took some action, and it happened. So now you've got the Republicans reflecting on it, taking some action to try and overthrow it. So it's, it's those big ideas, values, and beliefs that are butting heads that are at the strategic level, but they're also down at the squad and platoon level when you're leading soldiers or leading organizations. <coughs> so when you do and know, when you know what you're supposed to do and you're trying to do it, there has to be a structure. So, so when I look at the triangle, the things that hold that triangle together are structure in that there has to be money, resources, buildings, equipment, people, rewards, punishments, procedures to help you do what you know you're supposed to do. Because it's really frustrating if, if somebody tells you to do something but they don't give you the equipment to do it. And that's the leader's responsibility, make sure this structure is here so that when you assign folks to do, that they have the ability to actually do it. Now, if you're trying to inspire people and to get them to become, then, then they need to have a desire to become whatever it is that you, you want them to become. I mean, they have to have some type of buy-in. They have to have a, a want or, or, or that, that's gonna, that it's going to satisfy. And then finally, on the other side is the trust piece, is you have to trust that what I am doing is actually going get to me, get me to where I want to go. So you have to have the desire to what you know but once you get to what you want to become versus what am I doing, tr trust to, to know that it's going to get me to what I want to become. So, so let me use a quick example on uh, sharks. Let's say, uh, let's say I've been sexually harassed or abused or whatever, and I go to my first sergeant, first sergeant Porter. First sergeant Porter, you know, I, I, I think I was sexually harassed. And first sergeant Porter says, hey, what were you wearing last night? Uh, were you drinking? Who were you with? And now all of a sudden I'm feeling like, wait a second, are you, you interrogating me? I'm the one that was, uh, that was assaulted. Maybe you ought to be asking about who did it. Uh, so all of a sudden when I, when I get that type of response, my trust starts to go poof. And now I no longer have a desire to become, you know, a, a, a great soldier. If the organization is going to turn its back on me, then, then I'm just going to, focus on doing and knowing until I, my time is up and I can get out. Let me use an example of Paul O'Neill. So I'll get to the inner agency here and use an example of Paul O'Neill who was the uh, president of Alcoa. He was put in charge of Alcoa back in the late 1980s. Alcoa is an aluminum company and it was not doing well at the time and he was put in charge and when they put him in charge he looked at the whole company before he took over and looked at all their statistics and everything and thought, all right, 
if I take over this company, what am I going to emphasize? And he decided, I'm going to emphasize safety. So at the first press meeting, when you have all of the folks there and the, and the new CEO takes over and, and they start asking the questions, he talks about safety. He says, okay, if Pace is a fire, you know, there's two doors over here. You need to calmly exit the doors. And, and everybody's like, is this guy crazy? You know, he's not talking about return on investment. He's not talking about stock prices. He's not talking about efficiency and, and improving. He's talking about safety. And so a lot of the investors thought, man, we need to get out of Alcoa quick because this is some 60s hippie dude that's, that's going to mess this company up. At any rate, one of the things that he started doing when he emphasized safety is said that you have to report. <laughs> if there's a safety violation, you have 24 hours to get to me a report on what that safety violation was and what your plan is to fix it. So he established a routine, a routine that when a safety, ha a safety accident happened, they had to report it, they had to reflect on it to say, how do I fix this? But he also had to have the structure to allow it to do this. And this was the beginning of, of the internet. And so he made everybody have an email account and log on every day so that they could exchange information so that they would know what was going on if there was a safety accident. Well, his company found out this email stuff was pretty neat. And so what they started doing was emailing about other stuff besides safety. And, and the company actually became much more efficient and effective uh, with the safety piece. So if somebody, somebody uh, you know, got hurt because they're spilling 1,500 degree aluminum, they redesigned the, 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 the equipment so that you don't have as much spillage and it becomes more efficient as well as less likely to cause injury. So his emphasis on safety had a cascading effect throughout the company. But he established routines, made you reflect on it, and then he talked about how great our safety record is. And what ended up happening is he'd go to a plant and say, hey, if you see a safety violation or something you want to tell me, here's my phone number. Here's the CEO giving his phone number out to people on the floor. And what, what happened? is people felt like they could trust him. And they ended up calling him with ideas totally unrelated to safety, saying, hey, you know, we have a problem with aluminum siding. If you, if you put the colors next to it, we can change it out quicker. And, you, and they ended up making like a lot more money on aluminum siding because of somebody on the floor calling directly to the CEO because the same guy on the floor had talked to his supervisor for years and had never gone anywhere. So he built trust. In fact, they even had, one factory even, even put a, a, a silhouette of his picture up on the wall, you know, just uh, painted on his wall because they understood that his goal, the inspiration was no accidents. Their desire was that I should go home in the same shape that I came to work in. I shouldn't go home in a bag or a box or missing body parts or with a concussion. Labor and management both thought that was a great idea. Labor because, hey, I, I want to go home in the same condition that I went to work in. And management says, hey, I don't have to do the paperwork, and I don't have lost time, and, I don't, and I'm, I've got better return on investment if, if I'm not having the injury. So everybody kind of got behind this. He had one guy who was a senior guy down in Mexico who didn't report a gas leak. There was a stockholder meeting and a nun from Mexico, from a, a, a monastery, wherever that nuns live. What is it? I, I can't remember. A convent. A convent. Thank you. Convent. Uh, <laughs> whatever. I, 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 I'm not, not, yeah, my, my brother's a Catholic priest, but I'm not. So, so at, at any rate, they, uh, <laughs> they went to a con she's from This convent owned 50 stock, 50 shares of Alcoa stock. And she went to the meeting and said, you know, when he talked about their safety record, say, we had a great safety record. And she said, you're a liar. And he's like, no, I'm not. He said, no, you're a liar because there was a gas leak. Your, your plant down there in Mexico has poisoned people. And he went back and, and said, he talked to her offline. He sent somebody down there to figure out what was going on. And there had been a gas leak. And the guy that was in charge of the plant, who was one of the guys kind of been running to take his place, had just fixed it and not told anybody. Paul O'Neill fired him two days later. Bam, pew, gone. And so when people said, hey, Paul O'Neill fired him, they said, no, no, Paul O'Neill didn't fire him. He fired himself. Because the culture is that if you have an accident, you have 24 hours to report that accident and show how you fixed it so that nobody else will have that same accident. He violated the culture. He violated his trust. 
And Paul O'Neill wasn't going to violate the trust of all the people that worked for him and fired him. Didn't matter how high up he was. Boom, gone. So when you take a look at this, Paul O'Neill put the structure in place. He had the routines down, reflection, and the relationships to make all this stuff work. So let me try and start to operationalize this a little bit. <clears throat> Amy Wierzynski wrote a, wrote a paper about job, career, and calling and the, and the differences between the two of them. So I'm going to look at employment and, and talk about employment and how that is, uh, relates to this model. If I'm only worried about getting a job done, then it's, it, it's a job. I used the uh, example of a sweatshop somewhere in the world where, where you know, you've you got people that are producing, uh, uh, I don't know, shirts or something. It's like, hey, Thomas, you only did 49 shirts yesterday. You have to do 50. If you don't do 50 shirts today, I'm firing you because there's a half a dozen people out there that will take your job for that $2 a day. You understand? I'll do 50. Okay, good. So, I mean, you've got those kind of places throughout the world, the, the sweatshops. You know, me as the boss, I could care less about you, your family, whatever. Just give me my 50 shirts. And if you can't, then I'll find somebody that can. And <laughs> so that's kind of the job area. The career area, I have a, I have a son-in-law who is an IT kind of guy. He works for a, a company named Fishbowl. And they, <clears throat> they do supply chain management. Their business model is to hire kids straight out of college. Hire them out of college that are IT dudes. They train them up. They get them certifications. They do a great job. And then the IBMs and the Googles and the EBAs and, uh, eBays and Amazons of the world come by and say, hey, you're doing a great job. I'll give you $15,000 a year more to do exactly what you're doing right now. What do you think they do? <laughs> They're gone. Give me that extra $15,000. They have a career. They have an expertise. They have some knowledge that, that gives them a position and some authority to, to where they can maneuver themselves to, to go to the highest bidder if they so want. So I asked my son, I said, hey, why haven't you gone? Why hasn't somebody bought you out and sent you off somewhere you know, to, to hire? He said, well, there's two reasons. One is I'm part owner of the company. I have a little bit of stock. He's got a little bit of stock, not a lot, but a little bit of stock. So, so he has ownership in the company, so he wants to make sure the company does okay. He said, the second thing is, is I work for one of the senior vice presidents, and I have a voice in how this company is run. So he has ownership, and it's partly his company. Now, for, for the calling piece, I want to use a different example. The example I, I use is, is Doctors Without Borders. So Doctors Without Borders. There, there's, there's a doc in, in England who, who works in England for six months so that she can afford to go work for six months for Doctors Without Borders in some, in some area of the world that doesn't have nice facilities, if you know what I mean, that has very minimal facilities that maybe she may get shot at, she may get... Uh, you know, kidnapped or whatever. It's, it's not ideal conditions. And, oh, by the way, they almost pay you nothing. So why would you work for six months out of the year to have the privilege to go work in some place that's, that's not very comfortable, if you know what I mean? It's because you have a calling to help people, to, to do something for others that's more important than who you are or what you are. And that's why they do it. <coughs> So let me wrap up before I run out of time and, uh, and give you some, some, uh, a little bit of time for, for questions. I, I look at my job here. Part of what I do is a job. I mean, the dip map, right? Okay, everybody understands dip map, DP map? That's, that's like part of the job. You got to do that paperwork. It's just get it done. Yeah. Part of my employment here is a career. I have some skills. I know a little bit about teaching. I know a little bit about leadership. Uh, so, you know, I, I have a career, and, and I could probably uh, use my skills in other ways that, that may make me more money. Probably. But I also have a calling. So why do I have a calling? Because what we teach in leadership to every major in the Army, every soldier in the Army is going to feel that. Because every major in the, in the Army supervises soldiers throughout the entire Army. What we teach will help improve their leadership 
which will help improve our army. And so I feel like I'm doing my part to help make our army a better army by being better led by hopefully saving lives and helping us accomplish our mission quicker, better, faster. So I'm here because I feel I have a bit of a calling to be here. And so for me, this is like the best job in the school. I, I don't know of any better job that, than, than what I'm doing. And, and I'm happy to be able to, to serve in this way. All right, I, I want to show one last clip. Brett, if you can uh, show it. This is, this is the end of the, the movie. This is actually now D-Day. And General uh, Eisenhower is going to go talk to a group of paratroopers. Go for it. Now he's, he's reciting a letter in case he fails, but they didn't fail. So I wanted to show that for a couple reasons. One is because it, it, it goes back to they're well-trained, they're educated, and he's making sure he establishes a great relationship with them. Plus, it's D-Day, and he talked about the Jayhawks. So, hey, you know, it's a, it's a winner in, uh, in a couple different, different ways. Uh, but at any rate, I, I think the model has a lot of applicability to wherever you lead. <coughs> is you need to be in alignment because sometimes it, it takes more of a, a job approach, where it's more hands-on. Sometimes it takes more of an education. Our school here is about education. Sometimes you need to inspire people. And I think uh, it's appropriate to watch, watch uh, Eisenhower as he goes out and tries to inspire folks a little bit before they go jump into enemy territory. And he's talking seven out of ten. He's thinking seven out of ten of them are going to die tonight. Uh, and, and luckily it wasn't quite that high, but still it was, it was pretty high. Uh, at any rate, I, I want to open up for, for questions. I've, I took uh, a little longer than I planned, but I've got a few minutes for questions if anybody would like to ask some questions. Um, uh, probably about 12 years. And I still think about it. I mean, I still add stuff to it all the time. So, it, what's that? Thanks. <laughs> it, anybody else? It, if you don't have a question, I, I've got one more. One more slide. Oh, please. I, I wrote a paper on it several years ago. It's in the Small Wars Journal. It's called the Hands, Head, and Heart Leadership Model. Uh, but I, I've, like I said, it's, if I wrote the paper again today, it would be a different paper than I, what I wrote, I think, like four or five years ago. But yeah, if you want to look it up, it's on Small Wars Journal. Hands, head, and heart model. You, you can find it. Sir. Is this part of the curriculum, though, that every CGSC student Th This gets? model? Yeah. No, it's not. It's not? <laughs> it's, I teach it in my elective. Uh, I don't teach it as part of the, uh, as part of the curriculum. Uh, mostly uh, we teach in the curriculum people that have more of a famous name than what I have. All right. I'll thank you for sharing. <laughs> Thanks. I think just in the, the last thing here is, is uh, last year I asked my, my department to, to look at, at our summer train out, to look at where they felt they fit on this, whether or not when they came to work, if it was a job, a career, or a calling. And, and I hope it's a calling, because if it's a calling, then it becomes part of who you are. If it's a job, it's what you do. And, and if it's a career, it's what I know. And so I don't think I have any DeJamo folks in here, but I even put in ends, ways, and means up here just to, just to satisfy some DeJamo folks. Because a job becomes the, the, the means to, to enjoy yourself on the weekends. A job is how you earn your, your resources to do something else. The calling, your end is the job because that's who you are. That's who you want to become. In, in the career, it's, it's a ways, it's an action that you take to get the resources to, 
to be able to do what you want to do or to, to get the it, it, career is more about you because it's about promotions and competition and and uh, that sort of thing. So it, it becomes more about actions you take to provide the, the resources, the ways to accomplish uh, what you want to accomplish. At any rate, job is more extrinsic. And when I look at the Army, when I look at the Army uh, recruiting, you know, we, we've gone from, uh, from a draft army, which, uh, let me go backwards. We've gone from a, a draft army, which is more down here, force, to a volunteer army, where we, we went off with uh, be all you can be, right? Army of one, that's all focused on career kind of stuff. We give you an education, we give you good pay and whatnot. To where now, what's the Army slogan? It's Army strong, right? So we're trying to take a page out of the Marine Corps' playbook and get into the heart to talk about, hey, this is, this is who I want to be. This is, I want to be Army strong. I want to be part of this group. I want to be like the Marines. Yeah, we're looking for a few good men, right? And <laughs> once a Marine, always a Marine. So uh, at any rate, when you take a look at that, it's, it, they have always been on the heart, and the Army is just now kind of moving to that uh, for our recruiting. At any rate, I'm, I'm about out of time. I thank you for coming today, and uh, if you have any other questions, you can stay afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. Once again, thank you all for coming. We conclude this interagency brown bag series. Um, hopefully those of you will be returning here on the faculty will see you next fall. And once again, I want to thank our sponsors that enable us to do these various speaker series both here and down in Kansas City and in the town of Leavenworth. Um, you've all attended to those, but once again, thanks to First Command Services for sponsoring us and for the faculty and subject matter experts that are resident here at the Commander General Staff College faculty for providing us many of the speakers that present. Thank you very much.